Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the NACTA and Affiliates virtual programming lineup. I'm Dana Leroy, Communications Manager for NACTA, and we're glad to have you with us for what is sure to be another valuable presentation. All of the associations under the NACTA umbrella have been working very hard over the last several weeks to deliver timely sessions with relevant content for the membership. And we hope you continue to find these meetings and webinars helpful for your department as you navigate these changing times in our industry. Don't forget, you can find links to the recordings of past sessions by clicking on the virtual programming banner at the top of the NACTA Daily Review. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome back two familiar faces to the NACTA webinar stage, Drew Burst and Dr. Kevin Bully, for their second installment in Understanding Fan Fears. Drew is the Practice Director, Collegiate Sports at Dimensional Innovations, and Kevin is a Senior Litigation Consultant with Persuasion Strategies. Drew and Kevin presented back on May 14th to discuss the results of a survey they completed of nearly 600 sports fans relative to their thoughts and feelings of returning to live events and how these considerations might be able to help shape athletics administrators' decisions moving forward. We are looking forward to hearing updates and expanding on different avenues of this topic this afternoon. But before we begin, I want to remind our live attendees to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to send in your questions, as Drew and Kevin will be facilitating these questions throughout the presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Drew to start the conversation. A huge thank you, Dana. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we know you are plenty busy right now. And uh, the fact that you're taking time to hear this means a lot to us. And, and we really hope we'll provide you some insight. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, or as Dana just mentioned, right, Kevin and I, Kevin's a dear friend of mine, and, uh, and I'm excited that we get to do this again. I'm the Practice Director at Dimensional Innovations, and since we have some new folks on this, let's give a quick rundown of kind of what our companies do so you understand the background here. Um, so, Dimensional Innovations, we are um, designers, uh, builders, and creators of of experiences, right? So it is our world to go in uh, to sports facilities and, and other facilities and, and create great experiences. And that can range, uh, the solutions can range from, right, uh, visual storytelling in the form of graphics to interactive technology to uh, you'll soon see one of the world's largest 3D printed sculptures. Um, and the reason this, and here's some of our work, um, and the reason you know, this specifically is kind of in our in our category is because we are of the belief that even though uh, we've got a changed world at the moment, um, we believe that change is temporary and we believe it's still about the experience. So um, that's why I sought out my good friend, Kevin. Um, and Kevin, I'll explain a little bit more, but Kevin, why don't you give a rundown on, on you, on you and, uh, and your company? Yeah, you bet. So my background is actually in, in research and strategy. So my training is in psychology and a PhD in communication research. And so my work and my uh, career has been largely focused on researching how people make decisions and then developing strategy around that, um, typically with regard to persuasion and to communication. So the context of most of my work is in the legal field where my group uh, called Persuasion Strategies works with a team, uh, work with a team of folks who research how people make decisions in lawsuits. So we analyze jury decision-making, judge decision-making, arbitrator decision-making, and we get a chance to study how those people as decision-makers really deal with conflicting evidence, conflicting information, how they process complexity, and ultimately how they end up leaning in their heart of hearts um, to make decisions. And so that, you know, that is, I think, the natural intersection with with our topic today that we want to learn uh, how people are reacting to uh, to the pandemic and to the amount of information that they're getting about how to respond and then ultimately how they're feeling and what they're doing with that information. Yeah, and that is, that's why I saw out Kevin, right? So, so really what we are talking about, um, even though it's a sporting event as always, in many ways, it's a new offering. We're asking some people to, to do something <clears throat> in some ways different. So that is where I said, you know, the conversations out in the market um, are about, um, you know, the, the guidelines or whatever it may be. And my feeling is, hold on, we're asking people to do something uh, new in many ways. We need to find out what they're willing to do or what's worrying them. That's where we have to start. Um, 
so here that's this is exactly what we're doing and we're on the second round of it so um, again it's about experience we're, we're offering an experience that's our offering um, and so again even though it's changed we still have to focus on, on that um, and we did it uh, through survey uh, so uh, as Dana mentioned we did a survey a little while ago a month and a half ago um, and then we did another very recently so Kevin, you want to give a rundown on kind of the survey methodology and, and, and what that is? You bet. So ultimately, we wanted to find out, you know, what what the public and especially sports fans and people who attend sports events, what they're feeling about their willingness to go to events. They're willing to put themselves out in the public um, amongst uh, crowds potentially and, and go to our events. And so we started this survey in May um, and we started with about 600, uh, 600 folks across kind of all four of the major regions of the US. Um, we, we surveyed people relatively equivalently in different regions, and we got their feedback about their level of concern about the virus, their level of concern about events, their willingness to attend events, how soon, and a variety of different uh, circumstances under which they might uh, consider a greater or lesser likelihood of, of, our, of attending events. If there are masks at the events, does that make a difference? If the, the arenas or stadiums are at half capacity, does that make a difference? And so the first survey was in May. The second survey we just completed um, about a week ago, a little over a week ago from June 8th to the 10th. And the really important point about this top bullet here is um, in May we had 600 people respond and we went back to those same 600 people uh, and got about 400 of, uh, 400 of them to respond again. Uh, which is exactly what we expected, that we would have a little bit of attrition. But our goal is to not just survey a random you know, selection of people over time, but to ask the same people how their views are changing. So we have really apples to apples comparisons between what they're telling us today and what they told us you know, five, six weeks ago. Um, so that's really been the approach. Yeah, and I should add, right, the, the, the goal here is um, to identify concerns, right, and motivations. So in other words, right, our, it's 15 to 20 questions, takes less than 10 minutes. It's not about um, specific uh, you know, seating or offering inside a, a facility. It's about understanding what, what worries folks and, and, and their willingness to attend an event. It's just so we're, we're clear on kind of the baseline uh, information we're trying to, to gather. So there you go. So here's kind of your dates. Uh, again, like we covered off on that, just finished up uh you know the second one and again the idea is here to get data points um in this particular case though i think it's important that uh you know we do mention what's happening in the world not because we're studying that anyway but because we have to consider that it's it's going to influence responses so we know since our last survey right some major things have occurred um and kevin i don't know if you wanted to, to add any additional insight to that I think my view is just, you know, we we might be taking it for granted as as just we watch as sports fans, but, you know, a lot has happened in the public consciousness just to change, um, I think, the overall national sentiment about how likely it is that sports events will, will occur and, and whether there will be fans in the stands. And I think if you just sort of take yourselves back a month, um, maybe even six weeks, you know, I think that the national conversation on that has changed significantly. And so we, we at least considered that, among other things, as to uh, what to expect with our survey respondents and how their views may have changed or stayed the same. And, and I should, should add that the second survey to me has really allowed us to narrow in on, on two main things. One, uh, as you will see, uh, is kind of the, the, the really the key underlying fear or concern. Um, and the second is that really people's viewpoint is is based on sort of their individual life and experiences and a little less about demographics, if that's fair to say, Kevin. I think it is. I think it is. And we'll cover, you know, where there may be some some narrow exceptions to that. Yep. Uh, and I'll, I'll add, but as before we jump into this, uh, our game plan on this one is to, to make sure we allow enough time for Q&A. So definitely uh, shoot those questions as we go here um, so that we have enough time here at the end to answer. Um, so, Changes in survey. Uh, Kevin, uh, what did we find? Yeah, so we wanted to start with two big categories of what we're going to share. So one is what did we see that's um, compared from survey two to survey one? And some of this has changed, some of it is, is the same. Um, but we also then wanted to address the second category, which is what do we know that's new from survey two? 
So we'll start with the first, the first big bucket, which is what's the comparison between survey one and survey two? And as you see on the screen, the general conclusion about people's level of concern about the virus is down. And that's consistent with what you see in national polling. It's, it's probably consistent with what most of you are seeing in your, in your locales, um, that there's just been a trend towards, you know, okay, our overall concern with getting the virus or from changing our behavior because we're afraid of being exposed to the virus has gone down. And so you see those numbers in each of these three categories on the screen. Um, but then Drew, if you'll move to the next slide, I think, you know, one thing that we also saw is, is a little bit um, at odds with that notion. And that is that we actually saw in survey two, there was a lower percentage of people who said they would be willing to attend a, a sports event in the next five months. And this is with the caveats that um, attendance would not be limited in any way, but otherwise the event and the facilities for the event would have to follow all federal and, and local guidelines. So the presumption is you'd have to do what the CDC says with respect to large gatherings um, or public events, but otherwise the attendance of the event would not be limited. There would potentially be just as many folks in the stands as there could be while still following the guidelines. And what yeah. you see is that fewer people uh, in June are were willing to attend that kind of event in the next five months than they were in May. And so part of our understanding about this is we think that um, while fans still want to get to, to events, um, and there's a good chunk of them, you know, about a third of them who are willing to go in the next five months, even without changes in capacity, uh, what we see is there's greater awareness for the precautions and a greater explanation for why uh, people might still want to be holding off a little bit longer if there's no changes in capacity. Yeah, so to kind of paraphrase that, right, that, that we're really now getting to kind of the key nugget, right? So we're saying, okay, we're less afraid in general of, about COVID. Um, however, if I told you, you get to go to an event with a pool of people you don't really know, yes, the guidelines will be abided by, um, you're actually more afraid right now of that scenario. Uh, and that is a very key detail. It is a key detail. And the next slide helps us talk a little bit more specifically about that, that um, in our survey in June, we asked a couple of different versions of the question to assess people's safety concerns. And you see this top set of three bullets is what people say are their biggest safety concerns just about going out into the public. And those same three components are also their biggest safety concerns about sporting events. And that might not necessarily be that surprising, but the, the, the alignment I think is really important to what we've been hearing, which is that people's fears are primarily other people. And that social distancing is the way that they have come to understand they can buffer themselves from other people. Um, and I know, and Drew and I have talked a little bit about kind of what this means. Um, and Drew teed it up a little bit earlier that we're really talking now, we think, about uh, the individual differences and in how everybody across our country is reacting to this and people's fears about that individual difference. That if I go to a, uh, an event, I know how I feel about safety, precautions, distancing, masks, so whatever it is, but I don't know what you're gonna do. And I don't know what my neighbor's gonna do. And I don't know what the people sitting in the row of seats ahead of me is gonna do. And so that fear is really driving, I think, a sense of, we know there's precautions out there. We don't know if people are gonna follow them. Um, and so there is this, this conflict of wanting to go to events and feeling generally safer, but not feeling comfortable about what to predict. Yeah, and you can read between the lines a little bit, right? The, if you look at a month ago, everyone's pretty much stay at home. Then you have a, you know, some reopenings around the country um, and people are saying, whoa, wait a second, I'm not really ready for that. So while I'm a little less afraid of COVID, um, I'm not ready to do the things I see my neighbors doing, right? Everybody suddenly masks, gloves, it's all off, you know, do whatever you want. Um, that, that's sort of where we're seeing now a huge difference. Um, which then kind of leads us towards, sorry, before I move on, Kevin, or anything else on this slide? No. So, right, so then the question becomes, well, okay, then that tells us something, right? Is there a way, instead of it, this being about how do we social distance, is it actually a little bit about helping people understand the people around them? Um, and I think we start to see, Kevin can confirm, that that might be true. 
So this slide just shows the data average ratings of the social distancing components that would make people feel more comfortable. So we gave them a scale from one to 10. 10 would be sort of this, this thing makes the biggest difference in my mind um, to increase my comfort of, uh, about social distancing. And so you see the highest rated average response is that people say designated spaces, designated sections where distancing can be defined or can be uh, provided is the number one answer. The second answer is um, along the same lines, just using markings to, to indicate in public spaces uh, how far apart we all need to stay. And so, you know, that tells us something that those are by far the two uh, most common and most uh, powerful answers about how people will feel better about the unpredictable uh, concept of being among, among strangers. The easy concerns, right, about what I'm walking into. I have a much better sense of what I'm walking into in these scenarios. Right, and quickly, we just wanted to mention a few other of the key findings, um, that there's greater support for half capacity venues than for everybody being required to wear a mask. So this data table that you see here, um, people said that they would attend five months or less uh, if attendance was at half capacity at a 6% higher clip than if masks were, requir were required. Um, that difference between half capacity and masks goes down a little bit for those who said they would attend in the next six months or less. But, but what you see is a pretty big jump um, between the, in the half capacity uh, column there that uh, you go up to 71% of people who say at half capacity, I'm willing to go to an event uh, outdoors in the next six months or less. Um, so that, that's been an, an important indicator uh, that, we, that we see from this data. And Kevin, so right, we saw this technically kind of push out, right? Right, so you know, in May, we asked with these same options, um, would you be willing in six months? Um, and so we, we, what we could be seeing is that that six months is a, is a little bit of a, a safe buffer for people. They kind of feel like, um, yeah, I'll do that later. Um, yeah. And six months is kind of a key, a key time frame, you know, it, it may it may tell us more if our next survey in a couple of months, people are still pushing out this kind of six month time. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. And the masks one, we, you know, just to mention it, you know, the mask is a, a very polarizing topic, um, clearly, for folks, um, we can talk a little more about that. But but uh, that one is an interesting one. And um, this is just a little bit more on half capacity. So these things popped statistically in our analysis that half capacity, 20% say they would pay more for a ticket um, than they would at regular price if the facility was at half capacity. 30% of our entire group said they would attend an event in one month or less if it was at half capacity. And like we talked about just a minute ago, 71% would attend six months or less. So th this kind of pops from our data a couple things that you've got a core group of fans who would pay more and who would go soon um, if you're at half capacity. And that's, that's, that's one of the strongest you know, um, majority data uh, returns that we got when we asked these questions about various scenarios. The next slide shows just, a, I think, what is a, a relatively obvious finding, though it may not be as significant as you'd think. We also asked for the distinction uh, of comfort to go to an event for indoor versus outdoor. Um, the not surprising part is people were more likely to say they'd go to an event if it was outdoors. Um, you see in that far right column, just the, the delta, the difference between indoor and outdoor under these different scenarios. Um, and I think, you know, Drew, you, you, you voiced this when you saw this, I think, um, maybe some surprise that the, the differences aren't bigger than they are. Yeah. Yeah, um, the indoor one, it was really the one that surprised me, but that's a pretty good percentage actually. Yeah, and we talked about some various explanations for that. Some could be that there's, um, you know, that there's, you know, just different levels of comfort with who's around people sitting at these, at these events, um, different seating levels. Um, but I think one thing to note is there's still about 40% of people who say they, they are not going to go to an indoor event um, for at least a year. So, you know, there is a chunk of people who are making a distinction uh, that I think matters when you look at it that way. Yeah, and this is kind of right, again, it kind of aims towards the, the trend of sort of individual feelings of some people really ready and some people really not. 
Yeah, and I think I think people are also still waiting for guidance on on how to do indoor gatherings with large groups, and I think yeah. that's another component. Yeah, folks quite aren't faced with that one the same way they are with with outdoor yet. Um, so we also asked uh, some new new questions um, that I think you will find very interesting and, and quite relevant. Uh, and these stem in part from just knowing how how you know the decision making at the university level has evolved has evolved. So we found that about 7% of our survey sample said that there are students who are going to return to to college classes in the fall. So not a huge number, but en enough to ask some questions. And what we found, as you can see here, is that our student folks said, um, at least about 46% of them said that they are somewhat or very uncomfortable with the idea of returning to, to in person class in the fall. Um, but we also wanted to find out uh, about parents of students who are returning to classes in the fall. And you see that we had a chunk, uh, about 13% of our, of our sample um, said that they had kids who were going to go back to school. And you see a, a, a lower percentage of parents are actually concerned about their kid returning to in-person classes in the fall. Um, and this is something that we're going to continue to look at, but something we wanted to share since it's new to this second survey. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away by that one, right? Again, you look at somewhat comfortable. So this is the students, right? Students are less comfortable with the idea of returning to class than the parents. And I, I was, I will admit, I was quite surprised by that. Um, but at the same time, right, the student has to do it. So I, I do get that. But uh, you do just kind of assume that uh, a parent's going to probably be more cautious. Yeah, and it could you probably think to get out of my house. I don't know. Yeah, right. Get them, get them back to campus. Yeah. It could be wrapped up in age too. We, and we looked at that, that um, at least in our data set for this sample, there were some indications that older respondents have higher concern. Um, that's not necessarily the case in some of the national polling uh, across the country for age, but we are seeing it in this particular group. Um, so there could be um, there could be something a little bit funky going on about parents being less concerned about their kids because their kids are younger and they think that the, the risk is more related to older, uh, yeah. older folks. Yeah. Sure, sure. And then this is the one that we, we, we think is really interesting. We also asked our respondents in survey two, um, first of all, were they, um, well, first of all, what they would think about returning to sporting events on college campuses if classes were not in session. So if classes don't go on, but sporting events do, um, how would that affect your likelihood of attending? And you see from the, the graphic there that 35% said that they would be somewhat or a lot less likely to attend. Only 9% said they'd be more likely to attend. So clearly, a, you know, a signal being sent by whether there's classes in session or not. Yeah, again, I, mean, I think this is beyond relevant to our, our audience, right? Um, what's, uh, you know, what your school does has an impact here potentially across the board, of course, right? University policy, there's impact there, but how our fans going to respond to that um, is this is very much worth noting. And one of the most, I think, interesting things we wanted to find out because in this in this interim period between the May surveys and the June surveys, we have had news of um, college athletes testing positive. And so what we found is that almost half of our sample was aware of that fact, um, which I thought was significant. And then of, um, of our entire group, we asked how would knowing that, you know, an athlete has tested positive affect your willingness to attend an event. And you can see um, by far the, the impact is to say less likely to attend with half of our respondents saying that they'd be less likely to attend if they knew an athlete on that uh, at that university had tested positive. Yeah, but there's, so we have, there's some caveats to this before anybody panics, right? So Kevin, what we really learned from this as we looked into the data a little further was who was really the, the response about being affected or less likely to attend. So you're exactly right. Um, it was statistically significant in our analysis that those who said they were less likely to attend were more likely to be older. So more likely to be 65 plus and more likely to be women. Um, and, and we did find a relationship between the people who were in this no change. So the 46% who said that that news doesn't affect my willingness to go to events. In that 46%, there's a higher likelihood that those people are sports event uh, attendees, meaning they, they were more likely to say that they go to a pro or sports or a pro or college sports event 
five times a year or more. Um, so there's, I think there's an interpretation of that that shows that your, your diehard fans are in that 46% who doesn't uh, necessarily report a change in their view if they have a, a college athlete test positive. Yeah, so, so to kind of look at it this way, it is possible a, a student athlete uh, testing positive could impact a, 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 do, a donor, right? Like the donor demographic could be impacted by that, the over 65. But then, you know, in particular, uh, you know, public relations, right? So the public perception of that occurring, right, is, is clearly negative. So in some ways, it's a little less about the fans attending um, and a little more about understanding what, you know, how the world's responding to that news. Yeah, and this, you uh, know, sorry, go ahead. Those, I was just going to say those statistics are consistent with what, with what's going on nationally, that even in our sample, um, women are more likely to have concerns about the virus. They're more likely to have fears. They're more likely to have changed their behavior. Older folks also the same in our sample. Um, nationally, the survey data is really clear that the reaction and the fear is, is falling really clearly on, on political partisanship lines as well. Um, and so in some of our local university level surveys that we've done, um, we feel like we're also seeing that play out. Uh, and Kevin, a question popped up that's, that's relevant to this. Um, the question, was it about uh, testing positive? Was there any time frame on that test? Um, no. Like they tested positive this week or the next two weeks or just in general? It was just in general. Do you know, um, are you aware of the fact that NCAA Division I college athletes have tested positive, I think was the wording for the, that question. And then how does knowing this fact affect your willingness? So we didn't put time parameters around it. Got it, cool. So um, what do we do with this information, right? Um, this is great. This is helpful, insightful, of course, but, but now what happens? Um, and, and again, the great news is, to me, survey one and survey two lead us to um, some very specific things or some very specific measures, um, as opposed to broad-based guidelines, right, concerns. And I'll, we'll talk more about that, but right, we know fans are less concerned about the virus, but they're more aware of precautions and specific precautions, um, right? We know fans want to come out that they're scared and that, right, they're particularly scared of other fans and their behavior. Um, we do have to account for a wide range of concern between fans, between, you know, between folks sitting next to each other. Um, and right, despite differences, um, the, the, the good news is the core fan base does remain committed, right? We've seen that, um, certainly positive. Um, we also know that sentiment can change very fast um, based on, on what happens. We certainly saw that here and have seen it in the world. And in that, right, that jives with, with other uh, research that Kevin has done. Um, and again, I, I always want to point this one out. It is about experience, right? And anybody that's willing to do this this year, we need to treat like gods, right? We need to treat them as, you know, we need to be so thankful for, for them uh, doing this. Um, and we need to announce, communicate, and educate continuously. Um, transparency, you know, is very much vital. Um, and this is really leads us into to the core here. Um, building forums, finding ways to let fans voice their fears and sort them out. Um, so let's talk about how that plays. Um, right now, uh, as we, I've talked to many, many universities, many athletic departments, and these are really kind of the scenarios they're running through, right? So scenario one, do we have to consider no fans at all? Um, you know, are they ready to do this? And there's an indication that yes, they, they would seem ready to do this, or certainly a chunk of them are. Uh, you know, so I think for the most part, uh, other than certain regions, we're kind of ready to take that step. So then we all start looking at limited capacity, right? How do I get as many people in as possible with the utilizing the guidelines that exist? Um, or in some cases, in some states, you know, just go for it. And especially that second point, I think is, is kind of the wrong question, right? In other words, how do we maximize capacity based on existing guidelines? I, I actually truly feel and believe that what we should be asking is instead, how do we help the people that are in our stadiums uh, understand the people around them? That we are really need to play on the idea that we see um, in, in moments like this in history that, that we're in this together, right? So the, 
whether it be a pandemic, going back to the Spanish flu, whether it be an earthquake, um, major events that affect big populations, we find uh, that those populations come together. They relate, they come together like never before. We've seen that socially, we've seen that out in the world. Um, and, and really what it's about is fans feeling they have some control and understanding uh, as to how their day is gonna play out. Um, so let's talk about that specifically. I'm taking a step back from, from some of the things we talked about from, from the last uh, discussion. And that's because I think this change in philosophy is really important. Instead of looking at you know, the traditional methodology of seating, um, do we look at ways to group fans by concern, right? So we, there's multiple ways to do this, but, but we find um, a way to filter the folks that will attend our events by the concerns that they have. And, and therefore, to, to, for lack of a better phrase, group folks by like-mindedness and behavior, um, right? So, so that maybe we ease the concerns potentially on social distancing or we keep it, but it, it allows us to now say to somebody, the people you are around are acting just like you. Even though you don't know them, they have your same concerns, they're behaving the same way, right? And that's how we start to look at laying out sections of a stadium. Or let's take it a step further. Let's get even crazier, if you don't mind. Do we set a framework and hand over the responsibility to the fans? In other words, right, do we say this is how the game day, game day is going to work, uh, right? You're going to park here, you're going to enter here. Um, but from, from there, we are going to open it up our, the discussion to the fan base, um, allow you to organize yourselves as to how you would like to sit, right? So you can, however you want to come together as a group of people and sit together in a section, that is how we will organize you. You tell us, right? Two ends of the spectrum, but focusing on the same thing, giving control to fans, right? But truly understanding the root cause, the root concern, um, that, that is there as to why they're so afraid of other people, why they're more concerned about going to a, to a stadium than they were before, right? That's what we have to overcome, to, um, right? For, for the, from the game day environment to be most effective, feel most safe and be the best experience. Or we can go a step further uh, and say, okay, you know what? We're not gonna do fans. We're just gonna tailgate. We'll broadcast you know, the, the game outside. There's ways to do that, right? And we'll, uh, Come have a festival. You know, come have a, come enjoy the the game day environment, and let's let's alleviate the concern of inside the stadium. That one's the most extreme, um, but uh, in cer some circumstances, some circumstances, not the worst idea. Um, and I can jump to kind of kind of what I mean here. But I don't know if Kevin, if you had anything to chime in on on with that, but that uh, that jives certainly with the research that we have. It does. I mean, it, I think I think everybody gets that where this is coming from is it provides some some individual tailoring to the individualized fears that, that, that we're seeing people have. Yeah, and this is, this is really the way I describe it. I used Arrowhead Stadium so that no one would feel slighted if I used a collegiate stadium, but right, when I wake up, I'm gonna to come to the event, you can basically assume that, that the concerns, anxieties of that fan are going to increase, right, as it stands right now, as they get closer to kickoff, right? So, so our goal here becomes, how can I tell you exactly how your day will play out? You're going to park here. You're going to park around folks that, that have the same feelings and behaviors as you, right? You're going to enter this way. You're all going to enter in the same way. You're going to, you're going to sit in the same areas, right? Um, it's finding that line between we aren't trying to separate um, you know, groups, um, we, right? What we're trying to do instead is, is uh, find ways for folks to relate to each other um, and connect on, on their concerns to overcome them. Um, and that really is the key to planning, uh, you know, this year, if you will, this season, planning an event. That is the, the parameter. That's the, really the key nugget is how do we help folks not be afraid of the people next to them? Um, and that is different than how do we keep people social distance, right? How do we keep uh, X, Y, or Z guideline? That's not to say guidelines don't matter. I don't mean that. Um, what I'm really speaking to is the true underlying fear right? The fear is the world has opened up a little. People are behaving in a way I, I'm not ready to behave, but I want to go to the game. How can we connect them? So that's, that's kind of the overview, right? That's where DI comes in. 
Um, if you're interested in exploring, right, this part of it, uh, you know, here, this is, oops, sorry, this is me, um, right? So please reach out um, and we'll jump to Q&A, but, but uh, Kevin, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to chime in on with that. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think to me, to me to echo and maybe put a little bit differently what, what we're, how we're linking what Drew just described to the sentiment data is I think that what we're seeing in the data and what, and what I think we see in our everyday lives is that we feel like our individual response is appropriate, but we feel uncertainty about the idiosyncrasies of, of other responses. And certainly there is uniformity in some ways among regions, among cities, among towns, um, but it's not, it's not as high as, um, as I think what we might hope for. And so this idea that we are just trying to answer, how do we give some tr trust around the process of attending an event when there's distrust around uh, the individual interactions that we might have with other people who are also attending. Um, so that, that's one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is, is how do you try to, um, to compensate for distrust and create trust? And some of it is just by feeling, giving people the feeling like you understand their perspective and giving them uh, a way to identify with, with our solution. Yeah, kind of breaking that barrier. Um, that's right. Um, giving people the comfort to, to speak up. And sorry, I should add, I left this part out. We've been working with individual institutions. And in that case, we use the same methodology. So we survey specifically that, that fan base to understand the specific concerns of that fan base. That's kind of our starting point. So exact same methodology. This is a national survey, right? Pulling from the same pool. It's reflective of, right, the national sentiment. Um, and just so you guys know, the, the surveys we've done for individual institutions do align with, with these findings for the most part. Um, one of the, the surveys we have that's interesting is was actually more of a donor base than it was kind of a broad season or, or ticket data, database. And it actually supports very much what we just talked about. That group of people knows each other far better than, uh, right, than just the general public that might attend an event. Um, and we found concerns lower right for those folks coming together because they had a, have a much better understanding of what game day looks like and who they're around um so that was I, i'm looking at our questions that was one of them but uh, so you guys understand our methodology on, a, on an individual uh university uh basis we start with the exact same uh, uh problem if you will or the exact same thesis we have to understand what your fan base is afraid of um or concerned about um, before we can start planning that specific game day environment. Um, and I'm going to look at our questions here, see, see how we're doing. Um, yeah, and I can answer one of the questions is about yeah. the sample size of the poll and was it a national population that it was being pulled from? And the answer is yes, it was a national population. Um, the way that we tried to stratify it was to try to draw roughly equally from kind of each of the four major regions, so the, the east, the west, the South and the Midwest. And we were able to do that um, in both the first survey and the second survey. We started with 600 respondents in survey one and we had 400 repeat respondents in survey two. So again, just to reiterate, part of the approach to this methodology is, is more about seeing sentiment change among the same people um, rather than trying to compare uh, a sample from one month to the next of different people. Yep. That clarifies that. Uh, and starting with the first question I have on my list, I think I, I, I hopefully just answered it, but the idea that alumni or friends um, are show themselves to be more comfortable. We do not ask the, the survey that specific question, but we do have results that absolutely um, say yes to that. Um, then if people express a desire for, for college sports and if they're uh, not attending in person, are they likely to watch on TV? Uh, is that more than normal? Kevin, you can speak to a little bit about that question. Uh, we've asked certainly behavioral, right? Like more, more comfortable watching on TV. Yeah, we have. And, and what I would say to that question is um, people have expressed the desire to return to sporting events. Um, I haven't seen it as strong for college sporting events than for professional. 
There was just a survey recently released um, by Monmouth University that found that people are saying that they most miss sports that are currently supposed to be in season. So in that particular example, baseball was the, um, the highest ranking of all the sports as far as which sports people miss, followed by basketball. Um, what we have seen in our polls is that the, per the proportion of people who say they would attend an event in the next six months because they miss sports actually went down um, from survey one to survey two. Um, I guess one theory about that, it didn't go down a lot, it just went down a little. But one theory about that is, you know, in May, I think um, th there's an argument that there was nothing to watch that was sports related. And I think by the beginning of June, that had changed. So I think there's, a, there's an argument that maybe people were getting some of a sports fix from televised sports. Um, and you're about to be overloaded too, to that point. You've got a whole bunch of things that'll happen all at once um, is the other part of that. Yeah, yeah, there was, and, you know, we can go, go deeper on this if we want to, I don't know that we will, but um, there was also a slight decrease in people's um, perceptions of the sort of value of in-person sporting events versus TV from survey one to survey two. And that, um, that so in, in other words, people were more likely in survey one to say that in-person events have more benefits than TV watching events. Um, that went down a little bit in survey two, could be partially because people are just um, resigned to watching stuff on TV. And so they're, they're kind of forcing themselves to see it as, as better than it really is. Um, but that's also something that, you know, we're going to continue to look at. Is, are, are people's perceptions of the, the quality or the experience of TV watching changing as this, as this continues to unfold? Yeah. Uh, next question I see is, uh, do you think some schools located in states with fewer restrictions may simply allow full capacity and, and let the customer determine if they are comfortable attending the game or event? Um, I do. I, I really do. And, and that's, that's the one that we've kind of said, um, you know, is, a, is an approach, candidly, we wouldn't take. Um, what I mean by that is, um, I, I, we think the guidelines, of course, are, are very important, whatever guidelines exist. Um, but at the same time, that isn't the framework for event planning, or offering a product or whatever it may be, that we have to understand the end user, right? We have to understand the customer first and it is very very likely uh, based on the results of this right that people are not necessarily in the same state of mind as whatever the guidelines say um, that there's a very good chance they're way more concerned certainly about a group gathering right than than uh, restrictions that, you know that exist so um, our point again is that uh, we've got to understand that first um, if we really want to take care of our our fan base and I should also note in, in that answer, I also understand the things I'm saying are, are, are asking people to depart from their traditional planning, right? Or their traditional game day. Um, and my take is that this is a, this is a special season, um, a unique season, and that uh, I'm hopeful we're willing to look at taking, taking off any restrictions into thinking or any restrictions uh, for creative solutions. I think that's really important. Again, I, I, we assume temporary, right? pandemics end. History tells us, right, pandemics do end. So all the solutions we're looking at, we look at as, you know, semi-permanent temporary, right? Things that can, can be planned for. And if things change, you can, you can pull back out. Um, that's the way we look at planning an event of this type. Uh, let's see what else we got. Do you have these survey results? What we got, we talked about region. Um, in terms of watching sports on TV, was it collected? If, if this was live cable TV or streaming, et cetera, uh, do we ask streaming versus traditional outlets, Kevin? We didn't. We just asked if the, we just asked for the distinction between an event that was attended in person versus watched on TV. Mm -hmm. so I think that there's uh, I think there's ambiguity in how people may have interpreted that probably based on how they typically watch sports. Yeah, and we do, so other, other research efforts, we do know enough about, right, younger generation, way more comfortable with streaming, right, than older generation. Um, no huge surprises there, um, but that we, we know from a, the consuming content that that's, that's behavioral, that's, that's what we know. Um, another question, were you able to discuss whether having a liability waiver on a ticket would adjust people's perception of attending a game? Uh, we didn't ask that question. I think we can, 
we can certainly uh, respond a little bit based on, on what we know um, that again, with the, the, the premise that the underlying concern is about understanding the people around you, how they're behaving, what they're doing, um, some of those commitments certainly matter. Um, that, uh, that committing to, to behavior matters, whether, hey, this is on you, right? Does that matter? Um, the, it's hard to say. I don't know, Kevin, if you, if you would feel otherwise. We, we did ask in the survey if one of the measures, so one of the measures we evaluated um, and, and tried to consider whether it would make a big difference with people's comfort level in attending events was, what if people had to promise, um, sort of make a pledge in order to, to be admitted to the event that they would practice social distancing uh, requirements? And that was not a highly rated intervention. Um, that was not as important as other features that are more um, intrinsic to the facility, like social distancing enforcement or social distancing markings. So that's not exactly the liability waiver, but I think that the concept of um, individual personal responsibility and, and how that correlates to my feeling about other people creating risk is, is relevant. Yeah, and uh, uh, Kevin touched on a little bit there. So things like temperature scanning, ticket lists, um, you know, games, uh, those are low on the list of concern. So, so everyone kind of understands, anybody that's new, those, were, you know, those continue to be not the things that people are worried about. Um, they wanna be able to wash their hands and, and, and keep distance from others. Um, were the, was there any questions about uh, or concern about tracking people if there was an outbreak? Uh, that one's a little tougher uh, for us to answer. We, do, we didn't ask that question specifically, right? What's your emergency protocol if you have an outbreak? Um, that one's a little outside our, our realm. Um, and then obviously some of those technologies are, are, are national, Google, Apple, those folks. Um, and I don't know, Kevin, if any of our questions help to inform that at all. Uh, might have just lost Kevin, actually. But the, 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 the short answer to that is uh, we didn't tackle that one specifically. Uh, in other words, our, our, we're less concerned about uh, responding to, a, to an outbreak, if you will, responding to, a, to a, uh, an event than we were uh, about concerns coming, if that makes sense. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything. Uh, I think I've got most most of the uh, questions answered. Um, so again, I, I, the, the thing I would you know reiterate uh, one last time is is our goal in assisting you know our clients, folks we work with, is first understanding their fan base, right, and then planning uh, you know an event that uh, alleviates the true concerns of that fan base, um, and and doing it in a way that does not cost you. Uh, you know, a ton of money, um, or maybe costs very, very little, um, but doing it in a way uh, that is is novel uh, for this season, and and uh, and understanding that that I do believe long term things will go back to normal, um, or or relatively normal. Um, so we need to think that way. Um, let's make the season special, um, and let's let's connect folks um, so we can overcome those concerns, because that oh, that underlying feeling is we're all in this together. Despite the differences, um, that you know, our results show huge differences certainly in uh, in you know socioeconomic behavior, political leanings, you know, all that stuff matters. But at the same time, the the underlying feeling is that we're connected. Um, how would you recommend marketing the various seating sections based on preference tendencies, as you discussed with control too? Very fair question, because uh, it is a fine line, right? Um, in other words, <laughs> you don't, you really don't want to want to make fans feel like, um, you know, you're in a lesser category or a different category. Um, and I think, how, first of all, how that's explained, how that's controlled makes a huge difference and also how it's named, honestly, how it's labeled, um, rather than, you know, risk category one, right? Uh, we might give them a mascot, right? Make it slightly more playful, make it something that, uh, you know, an animal that's known for being uh, risk averse. Uh, right, so so put those into groups that that actually 
um, create some camaraderie amongst those groups uh, to me is very important uh, to sort of answer that question. Um, at the same time though, positioning in a way that we've heard you, we understand that your concerns um, are about the people around you. So let us help you overcome those so you can understand who's around you um, and, and make sure you feel comfortable. Uh, you know, position that way is a different story than we're going to categorize you. Um, I think that's all I see for the moment. Oh, wait, sorry, one just came in. Uh, were there, right, yeah. so were any questions asked regarding hospitality areas during a game, suites, club, et cetera? How would fans feel about going into those places? Very good question. Um, and so national survey, we don't ask about that specifically. Um, we have a couple uh, specific university surveys that tell us, um, depending on the school, the premium areas, um, those folks do typically know each other, right? So they have, they do have a better feeling about the people around them than the general seating bowl is how I would describe that. So um, we do know right out of the gates that, that there's a lesser concern from those folks. That being said, guess what the highest risk areas are, right? The enclosed premium spaces, um, right, are the ones where the conditions are about the worst you could possibly have. The good news is that's exactly kind of what we expected. And we think that's an opportunity to make that actually a more unique, special event uh, by making it a little more personal. Um, and so we have some solutions around that. But the good news is the starting point for those folks is a little less concerned. I hope that answers that. Um, and then in terms of parking lots, have people expressed that being uh, an untouchable area, or are they prepared for not being able to tailgate? Sorry, okay. So um, asking the tailgating question, we've not asked them, uh, right? Uh, do you want to tailgate or do you not? Um, and, and that varies dramatically by school. Uh, in some cases, you aren't gonna be able to control it, right? The, the parking is either not in your control or it's got something to do with the university or it's off university land. So that varies widely on how that would play out. Um, the good news in, in my mind, and I think Kevin would agree, and based on what we've seen, is that people aren't complete idiots, right? So in other words, they will group together um, with the folks they know already, right? So I'll, I, just, just the same way that, that, that traditions in college sports are created, they're created by fan bases, right? We don't manufacture traditions and then, and then give them to a fan base. They come up you know, in a grassroots way and they become traditions. The same thing would occur, I believe, will absolutely occur in a tailgating scenario. Folks will congregate um, in the way they should because of their concerns. So, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, looking in, oh, one just came in. Have you seen uh, a concern about fans parking next to each other versus spacing them out? Uh, no, the, the, um, the concern, again, ha haven't asked that specific question, but, uh, but certainly uh, more about uh, the, same, the same fear that exists about inside the stadium would exist outside the stadium. So knowing who you're parking to, who, who you are parking next to and who you're around is really kind of the key underlying concern, if that makes sense. Hey, Drew, I also saw a question about, um, did we inquire at all about um, kind of contact tracing, if there's a concern about trying yeah, to track? I think people. you dropped during that. Okay, yeah, so you address that. Well, you, what's, I'd love your answer, see if I was, yeah. Well, right. yeah, I wanted more tee it up for you. I mean, it seems like the way that you have, the, the way that you're talking about um, sectioning off uh, attendance and kind of level of concern, you're gonna build in some, some, some bubbles. Yeah, so, so the idea there is kind of my answer to that, Kevin, was the good news is you'd have the information on the fans. From there, I, you know, it really is the athletic department or even university policy as to kind of how you respond to that, that situation, that crisis, mm -hmm. um, right? Ensuring that when, when someone buys tickets, um, right, that, that, you're, that they're comfortable uh, sharing information if that situation uh, came about, I think that's important. Um, but, you know, going further than that, definitely 
probably gets into a realm that, that isn't necessarily us. But I think that part, right, if you buy tickets, um, it has to go through this portal. And part of that is agreeing that if there's a, if someone tests positive that's, or you test positive, you agree to let us, let us uh, contact those folks. Right. Um, student seating specific. Have you seen trends regarding students on campus being distanced within sections? As you know, most student sections are GA and first come first serve. Um, yeah, the, so the questions we had about returning to school and those, those parts definitely play. Um, in our mind, the student section really has to, has to abide by kind of the same guidelines as the rest of the facility. Um, and again, the, the really good news is in GA situations, um, I, I, I'm of the belief, you know, again, provide the framework and then let folks, you know, organize themselves accordingly. So in other words, you have to, you have to do X, Y, or Z this, this far apart, or it's marked accordingly for how you have to sit. Um, and then you guys can figure out how you would like to organize. Um, you know, I think, I think there's, there's play in that, but, but certainly abiding by the same general guidelines that you are in the stadium is important from, uh, perception, risk, um, concern of the rest of the fans. Uh, what are your thoughts on marching bands sitting in the stands? How would you space them out? That one's pretty interesting. I say that, right, you've got, you've got a unique situation because uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the study of like the Washington choir um, in the spread of COVID in the, in the choir room, the choir group. Uh, meaning you are huffing, puffing, and blowing on instruments. Um, that's a different scenario than than some of the others, um, and that one is unique. But but my let's put it this way: Would you want a tuba or trumpet uh, blowing near you? That's probably another way to put it. Um, you're giving someone a tool to to blow germs. Uh, I think that one has to be really thought through. And certainly put in a spot that that is not anywhere near other fans. Um, let's make sure I'm going in order. Sorry, uh, were there any questions on the survey or have you ever heard of any schools taking temperatures? Uh, any other testing of fans before entering the stadium or parking lots? I touched on this just briefly, but um, the, the general sentiment from our survey um, is certainly that that is low on the list of concern, uh, meaning that um, it would seem the general public are, are, are under, are, are getting more and more educated about how useful that really is, um, which is to say anybody that's ever used a digital, uh, you know, thermometer knows they are not perfect. Um, and then also, of course, the idea of the uh, asymptomatic person, right, that, that you know, if, if someone's got a temperature, it's too late, um, that the folks are really saying, I don't think that's a measure that, that moves the needle for me is kind of the answer we have on that. I don't know if Kevin, if you had other thoughts. No, I agree. It's, it, it's definitely not rising to the level of many of these other interventions that we're asking about. Yeah. Um, then we got a question that I think someone must have, oh, here we go, let's see. Uh, where does the wind, uh, Factor into people's confidence and attendance for a given game. If the court forecast is wind is 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 to be windy, presumably spread more. Um, not a not a doctor or scientist, but um, I think many folks would say uh, airflow would be important. Would be good. Would be a good thing. Um, certainly, at an outdoor event, um, that 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 actually would probably, in many ways, depending on what depending on how much wind, that would actually be beneficial. I'm not speaking again, not as a doctor, but um, as kind of my understanding, airflow is important. All right, well, we're coming up at the top of the hour here. Um, Drew and Kevin, if you wanna just give one last closing statement to our attendees. Yeah, yeah, so again, I can't thank you all enough. Um, and I, if there's one big takeaway um, you know, from our perspective, it really is uh, that we feel like we're, we're, we're narrowing in on the key underlying concern not you know there's not just one but there's certainly a major theme here um, and that now we can start to truly uh, plan accordingly that that's it once we understand that now we can actually start to tackle it and and we're ready to do that um, and and so if, if you are 
um, you know, please reach out. Thank you for the great questions. This is helpful in looking at how we want to continue to survey folks. So uh, appreciate all the input. Agreed. Great. Well, thank you both again for joining us today. Thank you to all of our members who are in attendance today. We appreciate your support of NACTA and all of our affiliate associations. Take care, be well, and we hope to see you online again soon. Thank you.